This is The Theory of Creativity with Sarah Garrison and our guest, Steve Goulding. What's up, what's up? Hi. Hello. So, we're going to be talking about music. Steve has been in a band for how many years? Uh, let's say nine. Nine years. Jesus. Yeah, ever since high school. But you've been practicing music for a really long time, haven't you? Uh, yeah. About 14-ish. Okay. Now, okay. you know. Started with recorder in elementary school. Learned the Pokemon theme. I'm mm-hmm. pretty proud about that. What are your main instruments? Uh, I would say guitar and vocals. 20 minutes is up. Yep. Next time, everybody. <laughs> Let's do a stopwatch. 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Okay. Technology. I'm a musician. I'm not good at technology. <laughs> but uh, no, I sing and I uh, I play guitar mainly. Okay. I dabble in everything else, but I'm not nearly as uh, as good at it. <laughs> So, what were your previous band names called? <laughs> um, my very first band in high school was called, uh, I think it was called Every Last Breath or something like that. Okay. Something, uh... Every Last Breath You Take. Yeah. And normally, I would love for it to have been about, you know, uh, Sting and, <laughs> and the police, but sadly it wasn't. It's more just an instrumental group. And then I was in a band called Considerate Karma... And Pariah Skies, and then Fire on the Green, which is like a really brutal metal group, and Two Punch Gun, which is like my alt rock new metal funk project, Mm -hmm. which did really well overall. And now I'm in Retro, Mm -hmm. which is the two piece stomp rock revolution group that me and Tom are going to do. Yeah, so you do all these local. These are all local bands. You've never signed with a record company before. So close, but no. No, I talked to them, but uh, there's a lot of. uh, politics i guess in it okay and uh it's really easy honestly overall there's a lot of groups and things they'll sign you and it's not like you know like maybe a big label start but like there's so many ways you can just chip away and get right up there it's not that hard okay so can you explain a little bit about the music industry um locally or you know big time i would say uh sadly depending upon uh you know your mindset it could be about money Mm -hmm. um I, it's really about presence, I guess. If you can afford it, um, it's really easy to talk to some scouts and people and get, get attention and get things kick-started. And there's a lot of routes that necessarily you don't have to have money for, but you know, there's people that will help. And, um, there's a bunch of artist groups that we talk to and a lot of friends go through and they have great, uh, opportunities that they provide to do big tour shows and, or do a show on a, like a passing tour. Um, that's great exposure for local groups and probably any any band. It's uh, like the Ernie Ball uh, contest that gets you on Warp Tour, and uh, and um, there's a couple of things out of Cincinnati that get you on these big uh, Summer Slaughter and Revolu- and just like these nationwide metal rock uh, tours that go around, and you just do a couple show competitions, and it's really just about exposure and promotion. So if you can have diligent enough members, like it's really easy with with Facebook and media today to. To like make a presence you just yeah. gotta physically do it you, you know? make it sound so easy but i feel like i if i was in a band i'd be struggling i would be like i have no idea where to start i mean we've had facebook for like 10 years i'm over posts like you know people just scroll now i don't want to read anything anymore but mm-hmm. like in a band all five members all four members whoever you got you got to talk about it you got to post about it you got to share remind you got to seem like you really want it mm-hmm. and then you know that exposure even if you're not paying a lot you know it costs a lot of people now so Facebook has this thing where they, like, take your ideas or something. Does that affect you with your music? That's a good question. <laughs> um, it hasn't affected me yet, because I don't think they've taken my ideas. But um, I, I know what you're talking about. There is this kind of almost, like, I don't want to say, like, pay-to-play kind of uh, mentality with promotions and boosts and even musical uh, directions. They, uh, they definitely want to have some say you know, if you're using their program, they want to get something out of it. And since it's a free platform, they'll they'll put any uh, restrictions they can. Right. Well, it's the same thing with venues, too. Don't they charge a small amount? Yeah. I mean, most admissions for certain concerts aren't, like, two buku bucks. Um, but, like, there's the local scene. You pick up tickets and you sell tickets. And, you know, you help promote. gets you active in your community. And then also helps show promoters make money. If they're not slimy, show promoters, it helps them and make money and the bands make money and the venue get attention and some people do it really well. There's a lot of uh, 
Dayton local uh, venues that do great for it and they know the business as well maybe um, they care more about it so they don't require tickets you know they just want you to promote bring people in um, you know because what you bring in depends on what you make so if you want to make money bring, bring in a people. lot of people yeah. you know if you don't care about it and just show up play to an empty hall or to whoever showed up and and you know you can go from there you know, yeah. it really depends on your work ethic I've been in enough projects with with uh, people that do not care they just want to play so they leave, you know, management to, to me or to the singer or somebody else who's active. And, you know, they contribute still in the band. And, you know, they were necessary people. But I've learned that it would be a lot easier with this market. Because you can take off real quick if everybody's involved. And luckily, the new project is just two people. We're both already, like, media whores in a way, I guess. I don't know so savvy. Like yeah, <laughs> media savvy. We, we like our attention when we get it. Yeah. And, um. But we use Instagram and Facebook and, and, the, and, the, and the other platforms. So so what would you say is your best experience so far that you've had with playing local? Playing local mm -hmm. would uh, probably be the reception that either friends or like people that appreciate music. Um, you know, it spend some time. It's necessary to spend some time. But like going to a show, even if it's just like Blind Bob's in the Oregon District or something like that. And you get 30 of your, your the people you hang out with on a regular basis there that either just support you as friends or know your music. It's like you get to that point where you're just like looking around just like, I got to talk to everybody. All my friends are here. There's so much love and just like everything. You know, it doesn't matter if they like the music. It's just like a big... Big love fest. It's a big love fest party, man. And everybody just hangs out. It's, I love when the community actually comes together, even with, with new bands or, or like, you know, coming to one of our shows or something. It's, it's always really rewarding. Now, what do you mean by love fest like are we talking orgy here or you know i think the dictionary states an orgy is what a group of three or more people with no shoes on so if everyone takes your shoes off it could be an orgy you gotta choose the right venue for that <laughs> yeah some people don't want me to take my shoes off in some places um but just like there's uh a sense of empathy empathy for what we're writing what we're creating performing um you know, one of my favorite bands from the local area is a, a group called Others by No One, and they're the most progressive, crazy, genre-jumping, just technically savvy group of people. I've, I don't understand the music. Like, it's so... Every time... <laughs> I've seen them 10, 15 times, and I love them all. They're the most skilled guys I've ever met, but I'm still just sitting there, like, biting what, my what's lips. What's coming just like, next? What is happening right now? Yeah. It's, so, it's a lot to take in. Okay. But, like... We know time enough to we can rock out and headbang and jump around and have a drink and we still have fun and it's just fun seeing your friends do something they love mm -hmm. and because uh, you can tell on their faces they're smiling a lot they're not afraid to smile a lot of people don't like to smile and maybe it's because I'm used to like the the girl metal metal scene where you gotta yeah. have a friend but no one's girl all the time man you just, if you're playing music you're happy you got you, you know jump around. rosy cheeks and you can't you, know. you can't frown while you're jumping. It's pretty hard. I, I can at least. And maybe that's why I'm not uh, in that genre necessarily. This is my favorite mug, by the way. It just cups perfectly. No, I see that. Yep. Um, so, talking about your best experience, what would be your worst experience? Without, like, you know, I guess putting a name oh. out there. Well, to... That is was my favorite feeling. I don't know if that was necessarily my best musical experience. Mm -hmm. But um, um, that could be a different conversation. But uh, worse, uh, I don't know, probably just like... When you feel like you're busting your ass and you did a lot of flyers or promotion running around and then nobody shows up when a lot of people said they would, that's kind of disheartening. Kind of, you know, everybody's schedule is different. Somebody's got to work, pick up a shift or you forget or something else. Like, I'm not the type to, like, hold grudges and, like, dwell on it. Like, in text you make it feel bad or anything like mm -hmm. that. But, like, it can be disheartening when you had, like, a big show and you were going to debut a new song and then, like, nobody shows up, you know. Um, it took a, a, a couple bands and, a, and, a, and a, a long time to get past that mindset. And after a while, you know, maybe it's because I started drinking a little bit more or I learned how to, you know, quill my anxiety and just loosen up. But it's like, it just becomes a glorified band practice. You got fun lights, you got a bigger stage, we could play louder. So uh, at least with Two Punch Gun and on, like we didn't really care anymore when people didn't show up, either because we were confident in our own abilities. Like we played first and we opened up, we're like, we're going to set the bar high. It mm -hmm. don't matter. We'll open up. Because everybody's afraid. Like, you don't want to be the first band. It's like, why don't you just blow their minds immediately? And then screw all Put the your other best bands. Put foot forward. Right. And then, you know, intimidate all the bands that follow you. Mm -hmm. Or play right in the middle and 
stand out, play last. I mean, it kind of stinks to play last because a lot of people don't always hang around. Mm-hmm. But uh, I'd say it's it's really disheartening for a lot of locals and younger kids that I've seen. Like, nobody shows up, you know. But if you're playing, like, I'm to the point now, like, I just want to play. So I, I'm not so bothered when uh, people don't show up anymore. I got you. But, so uh, your new band, you said you mentioned earlier that you were going to debut here in the next month. Hope so, hopefully, if I uh, if I if I don't be a afraid of cat about it, you know, I've never sang as a singer for a group before. I sing for fun. I mm-hmm. like to sing, but I was always a guitar player. So now I'm going to be right up in front, and uh, there's like confidence and hesitation with all that. But if I uh, if I stay on schedule, uh, we're hopefully going to do some shows coming up soon. So I'll just I've have a shot or two before. <laughs> A shot or two before the set, I should be fine. I think we got confidence in you. Um, so what would I you can't say... be that bad. Yeah, yeah, no, it can't be. That's true. Like there's it... so many different types of singers and bands out there these days. Like, is it impossible to be bad? Yes. Yes. I, no, <laughs> I've seen some bad bands. <laughs> um, but I mean, once you start doing it, like that's pretty much all it is. is it's Luckily, it that. won't be like bad music and bad singing. It'll hopefully be good music with. You know, mediocre singing. You can kind of balance it out. Are you gonna a sing bit. and play guitar at the same time? Oh yeah, I'm gonna sing. Ouch, that's. Uh, I'm awesome. gonna do whatever the feeling. Yeah, that's a something I'm working on. Mm-hmm. Let let the last practice we had shows that I need to practice. But um, I'll be doing both, whatever fits. So okay. um, you know, I might yell a little bit. I might, I don't want to say necessarily preach, but I'll speak passionately. You know, I might get a little angsty in the voice. It might be soft. It might be funky. Okay, so tell me a little bit about you guys' process. Um, I've learned more recently. It, it, it's better when we just start playing together immediately. I have pre-written riffs and little melodies and things that I you know, have in my catalog. Um, and sometimes the lyrics that I write can uh, inspire a riff, but I think like the true vibe of what we do and what people would really enjoy is when like you just kind of freestyle something and kind of feel it out. You know, I take a little bit to analyze it and, uh, you know, get it in. But then, you know, he just got, you know, the right beat or something. And I'll put a, a right riff to it. And it's just the natural thing that comes out. So do you guys practice? Where do you guys practice? Oh, we practice either at his house or at my house. Um, luckily, um, we both have the avail- availability to go full volume. Mm-hmm. And uh, friends and roommates, parents and all that don't mind. That's really awesome. Um, yeah, studios were nice. We definitely rented and made them before. But, you know, we both move around a lot. So... Uh, we have the availability to still write pretty often, which is which is nice, and it's comfortable because you just feel like you're at home. You know, got chips on the table or something. It's just everything's right there. The the atmosphere. Uh, you know, we take the home atmosphere and hopefully going to put that on stage. Uh, what is your writing process? Uh, I like I said, I just probably watch TV or just I do something inspires a riff or a thought, and then I'll I have have a recording program on my phone. Okay. And I write it, catalog it all right there, and I'll send it to him. And if he likes it, he's like, "Give me more of that," or, or like, I'll present it. You know, we try to practice every weekend, and when we when we meet up, maybe throughout the week, I'll just show him a riff, and we just kind of freestyle it out. Um, okay. It's uh not maybe we I, we know music enough, and we can just kind of like I don't know theory enough. You told me to play you an F, F major scale. I'm like, I don't know what that is, man. I play what sounds good to my ear. I know yeah. what flat is, and I know what's not in key to what we are playing, but uh, we both feel it out. Well, that's how a lot of musicians do it now anyway. Like, I know I a lot of musicians that just play from ear, mm-hmm. and it's like they play the best music. Like, I know somebody that can listen to an Adele song once and then play it on the piano Oh yeah, the next second. I don't know if that's, like, textbook skill or study skill or they have an ear for it. My friend Max is like i don't know what it's called but he can recognize any note like ha ah. he's like that's an f sharp like guitar piano you can play a chord with multiple notes in it and he picks them all out like mm-hmm. he's he's genius he's so good i can pick up things by ear but i don't know notation but um i think it's more natural it's like when somebody puts down a track and you just sing whatever that first melody that you heard and spit it out regardless of maybe how inaudible or bad it was that was the natural melody that you heard and uh and tends to be the most you know i think earnest yeah you um you sound like a very intuitive artist like some of my favorite artists are you know they they are kind of self-taught and 
just kind of do their own thing. So. I think it gives you more freedom. Yeah. If you, you know, no notation of scale so much, it's like you have this window or this box. You can only work in that box, right? Like, what do I do? How do I make this fit? How do I build this solo up? How do I, you know, get my intention across? Maybe this is a really, you know, this is a love song. I'm really sad right here. Like, how do I make this sound sad? right here and I can only be in the A major scale. It's like, I don't know. I just play what I think fits to either the riff or the emotion that is at the time. I think that's why probably one of my favorite things about music is that there's so many different genres and each of them can like encompass a different emotion. I think that's my favorite thing about music in in general. I think that's probably why it exists. Oh I, yeah. I don't know. It might be reaching a little bit, but I think emotions and art pretty much are like it's like chocolate and peanut butter like they're so in tune together like it's gotta be like almost the intentional why it exists when i studied music in college you know it, the earliest um evidence we have was basically like tribal indian uh like like i don't say seances but like rituals like they're getting you pumped up for oh sort of yeah some sort of reason and it was it was made to make you feel something like the purpose of it was to get you in a mindset of either rage or war or love or something so it's like if the grand reason why it was even that created means, yeah it was to feel something if you don't feel anything with what you're listening to now then it's probably not real music or it's yeah. not worthwhile yeah like that majorly guttural like essence of mm -hmm. what music was originally from i love all aspects of music and there's definitely like some screams and things that like you know they're like ah, eh, that's too much or oh, i can't understand this but like if the vibe of the music is right, if the atmosphere is right, it, you know, and it still is a certain uh, feeling or understanding that I'm like, all right, I, I can connect to it with, with, regardless of knowing what the heck they're saying. <laughs> they should enunciate better, though. That would be... Yeah, you know, so what is what is Screamo supposed to, like, try and enhance? I'm not really sure. I think it's just like an aggression. It's kind of like that punks, punky angst that came out of the late 80s with, like, Guns N' Roses and, you know, like, uh, Pantera and those just, like... You know, uh, like misfits, you just like really mean, rebellious kind of stuff. Sometimes I really just think they're just trying to break your eardrums. Oh, yeah. I mean, so many, it's become so mainstream now that, you know, people just do it for the technique. They don't care about the music. And that's kind of yeah. like where the separation is like, I'm doing this just because I can. How is that on their throat? Like, is that. Some people don't know how to do it. Oh. From what Doc. I watched this video. It's on YouTube. I don't know the link. I wish I did. But they put like a microphone. One of those like straw things down mm -hmm. and he screamed and it's just the way the muscles contract mm -hmm. so you can do it medically sound without ruining your voice but some people just literally scream or like smoke a lot or they do something that like makes their voice hor like very hoarse on purpose and it can definitely ruin your vocal cords you get you know scarring like what is it like thyroidy lumps or oh or yeah um the like they're like yeah they're like little bumps on your vocal cords that can really just mess up your yep they you don't... have to get them surgically removed yeah they don't shake anymore I know the singer of the used went through that, and that's why he can't scream anymore. Because he wasn't doing it properly, but gosh darn it. Any of that first two albums by the used, fantastic. Oh, yeah, they Look were amazing. Up. I love it. His so, tone is so... Uh, it's real. What is your favorite genre? Oh, girl. <laughs> Come on. I... Can I be can I be artistically vague and say feeling? Anything that has <laughs> feeling, I love. The feels. Like, I, I could go from, like, family opera to Disney to, like... You know, suicide silence. Like I, I can get into I, some Disney. I listen to who can't man. Hercules, Garrison. Mulan. That's my come on. You, you gotta let it, just let it happen, man. <laughs> Connect to it. But uh, I don't know. I really love like stuff with instruments. So like a lot of rock, a lot of alternative. I would probably date it to like pseudo two thousand five to two thousand nine. Like I love like the used and. And like early, that early that kind was of my like high melodic school metal. High school, mm -hmm. high school bands. Like My Cam, 30 Seconds to Mars. Those are my favorite bands. Don't yeah. perform anything that sounds like Kings them. Kings of Leon. But I love the passion Red of Hot it. Chili like peppers. the busyness, the angst. I, I've been listening to it for 10 years. So what do you think about the future of music? I think, uh, I think the future of music is incredibly bright. We can do literally anything now. And people are so good. They're mixing rap and country now. And. People are making millions off of it, like, regardless of how mainstream it is, and maybe not, you know, it might not be to my liking, but, like, if you can do that on a global scale and make money, like, obviously, we could be successful in any musical genre, 
it's just like I think the future of radio and all that is going downhill. Mm-hmm. Um, so podcasts, it, podcasts and things, visual representation, you know, interviews, the one on ones. People will always love that stuff. Um, okay, so we're gonna two part this whole podcast um, because of uh, sizing of our podcasts on our website. So feel free to listen to part two. We're gonna talk a little bit more about genres and about the music industry as a whole. Um, thank you for listening for this part one. Look it up. It's going to be great. Okay, so welcome back to part two of The Theory of Music with Steve Goulding. Welcome back, Steve. Hello, hello. Okay, so our last section, we kind of stopped at genres, and you talked a little bit about your favorite genre, mm-hmm. and the future of music. Um, oh, yes. So continue from um, where you were. Like I said, I think it's I think it's bright. I'm pretty optimistic. Mm-hmm. People are getting so creative um, with notation and like there's all these new genres like math core and all these things where people are literally counting the milliseconds and times and different ways to you know put variance in it and break it up and how can you put funk in uh, sixteen three time or how can you put metal or something so there's so many different avenues people are trying now and it makes it quite exciting for what people can come up with because even if you're not into it um, even if you just like music. Um, I've heard some incredible things that, um, you know, I d- didn't think people would come up with. So I think it's bright. I just think uh, we need to get these real ideas, like, into the mainstream. Okay. Now, I have had some questions that I thought of um, mm-hmm. considering the future of music and the theory of, because I've heard a lot about, like, this universal tone of, like, popular music where mm-hmm. it pretty much all sounds the same. Exactly. Now, why is that, do you think? Because it makes money. Ouch. That's like, uh, I know a lot of labels and a lot of uh, radios that want the same kind of sound because they know it plays well and sells well. People want to hear it. So, um, I mean, why does a lot of, uh, maybe the last three years, why does a lot of the rap and the singing style the same? Why is all the, you know, the rock the same? It's, it's all about money, mm-hmm. I would mm-hmm. say. If you can be an independent band, be as independent as possible. Um, you know, do what you need to to help get, um, you know, promotion. But, like, I feel like you will always stay true to yourself if you're more independent because you still get to control your music. Or sign with the right label. Just do your research. Because um, I know, I'm not going to name drop anybody because they're, it's pretty rude. But there's a lot of labels that will manipulate you into sounding the way they want you to sound. Mm-hmm. And um, I will not trade my, my, individuality for success has anybody ever told you to change your sound uh yeah people that come to shows or are you know parents or people that would always love to make suggestions and um you know some of it it's always helpful to hear you know what they think that way because you you can bridge the gap between them if you kind of compromise a little bit but some people just want you to do something completely different and some people I uh, think good people don't. They want to see what you can do. Just do it better. So, what do you think that would make you better as a band? I think confidence. Okay. Um, because I feel like we are the right group of the two of us that we're we're pretty. I don't know. We're pretty. We're some. We're hooligans. We're, I like to always think of like we're a two piece motley crew. Like we just love the loud energy and the fun and the shenanigans and you know. Uh, we like the rock and roll lifestyle, and we feel, I feel like rock stars have kind of died out. There's not really any more rock stars. You know, people don't embody that that presence of kind of like, I really care, and this is why I'm doing it, but at the same time, I don't give a fuck kind of mentality. Mm-hmm. And um, so I think if we can just have the confidence and own it, like, we're used to living out of a car or not making any money or, you know, not having people not get the music right away. So we're not really against the scrutiny, just like, it's a slow build right now, restarting. And uh, I think with confidence comes your production rate. So if I could have more confidence in it and knew what I wanted to do, then I'd probably be shelling out material and mm-hmm. be ready to go. So I think after a couple of shows, after the writing process the, and the recording is finished and we kind of see the finished project, I mean, then it's just promotion. So. Um, and what is your band's name? Or I'm sorry, what is your band member's name? <laughs> My drummer, his name is Tommy. He's perfect for it because every drummer's named Tommy. Mm-hmm. And um, the band is called Retro. It's a two-piece, I call it stomp and roll. 
I'm kind of trying to come up with like a, a thing, but it's, you know, it's all about like stomping your foot and rock and roll and just like a good guitar vibe and a good overall vibe. Um, mm -hmm. It's definitely hopefully something that you will always enjoy live because I don't know how to capture it via recording yet. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, so, hmm, I had another question, but now I don't remember it. Um, I know. So, would you say that there's a difference between the people who sign and the people who don't sign with records? Like between the artists or the people signing us, or mm, let's just say artists in general first. Oh yeah, most of my friends who have been doing it for longer than I have that are trying to get signed are still doing their music. So they haven't either been manipulated to change yet, or they just have the you know the the will to not change to do it. So. They are some of the most passionate, like real musicians I've ever met because they're doing what they love, and you know, for the singers, it comes from the heart. The guitar players and all that, they're dancing and playing, you know, the riffs that they love to play. So it seems really genuine, really real. And with people that I hear about, I don't really know too many signed uh, artists or anything like that. But just either cross the paths when we open for them at shows or something, they just kind of had this like, I don't know, this poise of like like pretentiousness like they're a little better than you because we made it but it's like you didn't you're just you have people helping you out you're doing the same exact thing we're doing your mentality is like really rude because you think you're better than us just because you have a label it's like but your music maybe the message is not nearly as good or the instrumentation like you know. so it's like an ego boost oh it's definitely an ego boost it is definitely an ego boost um which i think is good to know you know you it's a hard business. There's thousands and thousands of bands and groups trying to, to make it. So it's definitely like, yes, all this work has paid off. But like, if you just become like an old, a begrudging old fuck about it, then mm -hmm. like, nobody's going to like you. Right. So maybe it's like their like mentality has changed from, um, you know, being like an unknown to a known mm -hmm. because they're like, oh, we're one step ahead. Now what's next? So they're like, maybe, I don't know, like, I don't know. Is there a difference in focus, maybe? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not in their position, so I don't know if their actions are being guided by, you know, by the record or by the fans, you know? Like, uh, I know one of my favorite bands, My Chemical Romance, when they put out their last album, it was a completely different sound. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, you know, were hesitant, and they questioned it, and they probably lost some fans, and they were in new territory, and they... And uh, I loved it. I thought it was fantastic, but I love music, and I can find something to appreciate in every you know aspect of their style it still sounded like them it's just a different mm -hmm. um so there's you know those artists who can use it to be like well, well this sold really well we've been doing this for 10 years i'm kind of over it myself let's how can we bridge the gap between maybe something that feels like this but is also different you know and people can make it work you know there's also artists like you know like megadeth and metallica that have been basically putting out the same sound for 30 years and you know and it works platform sells well they've got People a set audience it. you know i think a lot of the younger bands probably have to change because the younger audience keeps you know, changing yep it definitely does yeah sadly i mean that's why you like most bands are trendy bands you know they're around for a year they'll be on the big show and then they you don't hear about them anymore you know it's because they either didn't have it enough to like stick it out or it's just their sound was just like a face mm -hmm. so that's kind of like why we named it the project retro and Tom and my mindset like what's the conglomerate of all these sounds that will kind of always be timeless but be relevant or refreshing and um, I don't know maybe something always happens with with time you know I used to be in a really brutal genre because I thought that that would be re you know um, rebellious and that's kind of changed you know and how can I be as heavy without playing like that you know some people call it selling out some people just call it cha changing genres um, it's definitely a mindset thing. Okay, okay. Um, I think if you're not playing it, if it doesn't matter to you when you're playing it, and you're not, and you can't feel it or you don't care, that's the most evident thing. And the worst thing is like seeing super signed people that inspired you playing music that looks like they don't give a hell about. Um. Well, so maybe that's the, maybe as that's what the business does to you. <laughs> right. So as far as um where the money can take you, you know, after you get signed, is it as far as wherever you want to go? Or, like, is it, like, do you think there's, like, a cap on it? Uh, there's probably a limitation. Uh, I'd be like, yes, first record label, let's go to China. Like, if they're backing you or you're doing it independently, there's always going to be some restriction. 
I think you can, I mean, traveling and things are so common these days, you could probably go anywhere you want on the planet. Mm -hmm. You just got to know how to promote it. Um, I would say stateside and all that with the companies that are here, you could get huge success and literally only stay in the country. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think there's a cap on it, though. There's obviously places we can't go. I'd love to play in North Korea and yeah, like, rock how the house, show them some sweet music, but that's probably not going to happen anytime <laughs> soon. How do bands become popular overseas? That's one of my next big questions. I don't know, because Europe is like... It's a cesspool of different music. Hugely successful bands in Europe that are... American bands that do not do well in the States. Mm -hmm. um, it's like like a cult following or something. I don't know. They just find certain bands and they blow up over there. Well, yeah. The UK, I think, has probably brought out some of the most popular bands of the last like 10 years. Mm -hmm. I would agree. I don't know how they figure it out though, more than we do. Uh, it's got, maybe because it's, it's more compact, smaller. Mm -hmm. So like you play a couple shows there and maybe the mentality, it's much more of an artistic region too so yes uh older i don't know let's go to europe and find out all right sounds we'll good podcast over there and play some shows over there and we'll see what happens find some good bands <laughs> yeah some of my favorite bands are from the uk almost most of my bands and actors not to digress oh but yes i love the english the eastern culture it's just it's overtaking everything and i'm all for it so is that maybe where you guys want to go if it <laughs> doesn't oh. happen over here as, as a natural like italian person man I'm not a person. Um, and just a lover of traveling. I just want to go. I would go without music. But who does not be like, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to Liverpool to, to play a show for my band. I feel like that would be like... That would be incredible. Yeah. <laughs> I say why not? Like, you know, just play some of your amazing songs here and then, like, you know, gain enough money to just travel. There's a band that I saw that was really huge in the Dayton, Oregon scene. And they go to France every year and they play and headline sometime this big festival. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, they're all, all the people in the band are bartenders. The, the bars, they all bounce around, you know, and they do small couple week tours. It's not like they're on, I don't think, eight month. What's the band tours. name? The band is called Grand Mammoth. Check it out. It sounds a lot like The Sword and, and like retro, it's really old school rock. Mm -hmm. Great vocals, great singing, sweet looks too. They're all like big artsy, like flowery, long haired, like just burly bearded dudes they're fantastic musicians they're great at check them out um but they go to france every year and they play this big festival and i was like how do you guys do this and they get called back and they're like sponsored up in this big hotel and they like play in front of thousands i think of it's just getting out of there you know like getting out of dayton pretty much but to be huge and only like once that's just such a specific thing you know you had to find a way to do that and then like you're not known even like you're not even known in cincinnati you know Two hours away from here, and nobody knows about you. Right. So then, is your goal for your band to just be famous here in Dayton? I think it's we'll take it as far as we can. Okay. Um, I like to have influence. I've never like fantasized about being a rock star necessarily, but if I you have the ability to teach or influence people, I'd love to take it as far as I could. So, I'm just I just want to do it full time. I don't want to have to worry about waking up at five a.m. to unbox trucks or worry about my bills anymore if i can just do music you know whatever that means that i would be totally for that have you ever thought about teaching yeah i think i'll probably end up doing that when i'm older but i'm in my prime right now so i want to travel while i can and be adventurous while i can got you i stomp around a lot my neck's normally pretty sore after the shows so i want to do it while i can <laughs> <laughs> i'll definitely have a arthritis in, yeah. in my older age <laughs> from playing guitar and yeah, jumping from around bad on ankles stage. and I we'll call it a bang over. A bang over. Yeah, you, know, you head bang too hard and you just feel it in your neck all day. Ugh, or I'll probably be deaf because I don't wear earplugs. Yeah, that's one of my biggest I, concerns. I, too. I do every now and then, but sometimes like I need the volume. Mm -hmm. You know, the presence like the band I talked about before, sixty eight, is a two piece group, and they're like dirty sludgy blues, like just two people playing drums and playing these songs and they're the loudest group I've ever heard and I've compared to like five piece metal band super groups like they are right up there like they are so loud and it blows my mind and it's just two people yeah but it's like the, you need that volume it puts the weight and the presence in it and it's just like when they perform it that way and you're just like I get it it's just, there's something here hmm can only imagine I don't really go out that often to experience any of these you bands need to check them out. Or, 
I'll send you a link. You can at least watch a live video, and you could probably get it. Okay. Because okay. people want to be entertained, I think, more than they really want to listen to anything these days. Mm -hmm. Like, I'd love for you to buy an album if I put it out, but I can't guarantee that the general populace is going to do that. But if you could be like, dude, you got to go to their show. They, it's fucking sweet to watch, and it's good music, and it's entertaining, you know? That's another good question is, like, how do you find these bands? I mean, I, I don't Tommy ever hear <laughs> anything about, like, until you were like, come see my show, Two Punch Gone, like, two years ago, I would have never even known that you had a band. Uh, media, I, 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 like, Facebook, and, like, I follow a lot of, like, popular magazines, alternative press, and, and music-based things that always kind of shell out some bands, but YouTube still is fantastic i don't know how long that that son of a gun's been around but you click on one band and there's all these related artists and i just go through the playlist mm -hmm. put it in the background do some art work do something and you're just like i hear about it or pandora there's so many music platforms today pandora is good for showing you new things because they keep it very random overall i think spotify is better because you can listen to it without the ads and you can stop and start your songs whenever you want exactly now now my question um was kind of like more geared towards the local scene you know like why isn't there a website you can go to to check out local date and bands you'd think they'd all sign up for that like i think my space just hasn't been done yet you stick yeah Ooh, that's a good idea maybe sort of like a date and area where literally every band of every genre comes down and we'll break it down and you're like i want music from this area what blues bands are around here Ooh. And you go to datemusic.com and literally you type in your genre, or we'll have tabs. Everybody loves tabs. Steve Goulding, the entrepreneur <sighs> slash band it's member. Coming up with something. But it's like us too. Like I love going out. And I've braced it as an adult. You know, you don't have to drink or do anything, but it's just good to like be around the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been craving some live, like soulful, like jazz. Like I want some La La Land piano and you know some like just like trumpets and stuff and like, but like local bar doesn't play that. Right. But where do See, you have to go? I think there needs to be some place where you can go and just say, yeah, like datemusic.com, look up what bands are playing in the next month mm -hmm. or year. I don't know. See where their venues are, see how much the tickets are, and then bam. There just be a lot to maintain. Sure. Because if that's owned by like a radio station or something, then they're probably only going to do the music that they want to play. Well, I don't know. Maybe it should be like unbiased where it should be the bands that sign up for it, not so much the host. I would agree. Mm -hmm. I think it'd just be more like a geographical right. thing. It's more like a government database of music. Right. Yeah, I think that would be great, especially for the local Let's get scene. on this. All right. I'm going to buy the username or buy the URL. Let's yeah, see what we can come up with. Because I got a lot of friends and bands. A lot of the music I'm into currently is out of Cincinnati or Columbus. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's bigger cities. Yeah. But, like, I don't know anything about the areas, so I have to ask them or... Or like, the, I bookmarked all the venues that I played at or applied to play for when we were looking for shows. And then that, you know, every time I look it up, I'll see a band. It's like, oh, that band's called Fever War. Like, what the heck does that mean? Yeah, I would never know. So then you got to do your research. Uh, but I think a, a conglomerate website would be incredibly helpful. Yeah, because, I mean, these smaller bands, like, how do they get their names out besides, like, posting flyers, you know, social media? It requires a lot of effort on your behalf. If there was something where you could just, like... You got to pay for it now, too. Sponsorship's not free. Yeah, yeah. It's you not post some, You got 5,000 followers, and you post something, and only 200 people see it, because they limit it purposely, so that they, you can pay for it. Like, I understand you're trying to make money, but at the same time... Like, it's kind of rude. Like, I earned all these followers. It's like, now i got to pay you for them to see the music they already want to see? Like, uh, <laughs> you tired of getting ads? It's like, I'm just looking up a cooking recipe on YouTube, and i got to see Allstate, and then i got to see some Marvel trailer or something. And, like, some of it I love. It's like, stop trying to get my money now. I'm broke. I have nothing. Skip it. Come on. Well, you know, this could make you uh, rich, so you should think about this it. This could make us rich. But then I would have to charge all the bands in admission a one time. Well, is it? Fee. Do you think that you would charge them? Right now, I say no because I am a band. But if I was, you know, regulating 500 bands and I had to make sure, because what are you paying well, for? Well, you could um, charge for advertising on the website. Right. I'm saying, like, the, the artist would obviously want something that's regulated and up to date and being presented. Like, if you're looking for music, come here. So, I, you know, I have to do something to balance it out. But, like, I shoot photography for live bands and I know how much being a band member. I I set my prices accordingly. 
So, like, I would do the same thing via advertisement. Fair enough. Fair enough. I think that'd be good. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, well, is there anything else you'd like to talk about today here? <sighs> today? Uh, I don't know. Look up more local music, because it's fantastic. There's some of the best musicians you're ever going to find are probably going to be local, and it'll be real. And uh, just start caring more. Look up music that cares more and matters to you, and if it, you don't feel nothing, move on. Steve Golding, everybody. Preach. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank um, you. Have a wonderful day.